evil minds try to understand you and try to decipher who you are and what you are and how you made all things. But the closer we get to understanding, the further we are because you have not revealed yourself unto us fully yet. Therefore, with the little comprehension that we have, Father Lord, we stand before you and exalt you with our praises, with our heart, with our lips, with our claps, with our dance, with everything that we are, we exalt you. May we continuously worship you and adore you and sing your praises for endless days to come until when we stand face to face in your presence eternally and you call us your children. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all of God's children say amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. We call on the ushers to wait upon us with the element of communion. If you, as you're walking in, you didn't grab the element, please lift your hands and the ushers will wait upon you with the element. Pastor Leighton will lead us through the communion while we continue with worship. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all.
to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. I wish I could only say it like my brother Art. He can sing so good. Amen? So my question today is, to each and every one of you here is, what do you need to surrender to today? What do you need to surrender to today? Some might need salvation right now. Some are sitting here dealing with things of this world that are probably driving you nuts, and you need Jesus. You need to surrender. Or maybe someone has already surrendered here, but is still living a life that doesn't please God. The news today is you can surrender that to him today, right now. Whatever the case, you can leave it at the foot of the cross right here, right now. I surrender all. Three wonderful words. This calls us to a place of reflection and surrender. It's, let's remember how Jesus surrendered for us and what the cost was. It all began with surrender. Why is that? Because Jesus surrendered it all. In the garden, the human side of him struggled and said, Father, if there's any way, any possible way, take this cup from me. But no, let your will be done. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. At that moment on the cross, he surrendered, and that surrender led to sacrifice. And that sacrifice ultimately led to our salvation that will lead us to an eternal life in heaven with him. What an awesome gift from our Savior. But now in return today, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual act of worship. And as we get ready to partake, let's bow our heads in humbleness right now. Bow our heads in humbleness. Ask the Holy Spirit to seek inside of us, to examine our hearts where he lives, asking him if there's anything we've been doing to dishonor. God. Ask him for that area in your heart that will still need for you to fully surrender it to him. Let us thank him for saving us. Let us thank him for the salvation that we have through his precious blood. Salvation isn't just about accepting a gift, but giving ourselves back to the giver. Let's remember our Savior's surrender, which led to his death, which led to our salvation. Let us commit today, or let us recommit our lives to him today, trusting that his love and his grace is truly sufficient for all of us so we can partake together in unity as one family. Now, I want to share a little something with you that I shared with the other two services, and I'm not ashamed of it, but a few days ago, you all know that I've been on this diet where I lost almost 60 pounds, and it's uh, eating protein and getting off all the carbs. But my wife and I, we have a cheat day sometimes. And you know, a cheat day could be just a hamburger with the bread. But we decided to go to Texas Roadhouse. And if you know Texas Roadhouse, they have the most wonderful dinner rolls you ever ate. They were like little clouds of loveliness. <laughs> with the best cinnamon butter I ever had. Hallelujah, look at that. Oh my gosh, I got a Hallelujah. But as I was eating that wonderful bread, I ate seven dinner rolls. I don't eat bread, but it was that cheater day that got me going. And 
those rolls, they tasted so good. But as I ate those rolls, as good as they tasted, all I started to remember was how bad they were for my health and the damage it did to my body in the past. It tasted so good, but it was so bad for me. But this bread, bread of life, this bread that we hold in our hands today, that I hold in my hand right now, may not taste the best, but it reminds me of the day that Jesus took everything bad in my life when I came to this church and made it good because of one thing, because of that one day, I surrendered it all. Together, taste, eat, remember, and surrender. Let's take the bread. And the cup. All together. All to Jesus. I surrender it all. Well, today we are continuing uh, in our series on the foundations of our faith and the things that unite us uh, as a church. When I was a kid, I had some negative experiences around swimming pools. So to make a long story short, I never learned how to dive head first. I always jumped into water feet first, but I always made sure that the water was deep enough to be over my head. And that actually is a good metaphor for how I've conducted my life. <laughs> Feet first and over my head. Every decision I've made, I'm all in. I'm totally immersed uh, in the decision. And that's really how I picture the Christian life, and especially baptism as a part of the Christian life, being totally immersed in the life of Christ. Now, the most common mode of baptism is immersion, it symbolizes being buried with Christ and then raising up out of the water, being raised with Christ in order to live the rest of my life for Christ. Now, water baptism not only depicts Jesus' death and resurrection, but it also depicts the salvation that has already happened in our lives. Before baptism, we invite Jesus into our hearts as Lord and Savior. In baptism, we become immersed in the life of Christ, and in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to expand on that thought as we take a look at baptism today. So uh, for me, baptism is one of those mysteries in the Scripture. It involves the literal, the physical, and the natural, and the symbolic, the spiritual, and the supernatural. The literal, the physical, and the natural, that's the water part. But the symbolic part, that's the death and resurrection that's symbolized uh, in the action of baptism. The spiritual part is the Holy Spirit, and as we're going to see, there's a specific reason why Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. That's to give us the power to witness for him. And then the supernatural part, that's my favorite. That's an identity change. That's where you get a new driver's license, right? With, with a new picture and a new address, because your, your destination is heaven now. Uh, and you, you move from being a sinner to a saint, a son with a heavenly inheritance. Whoa. There's a lot waiting for us, but there's a lot to do right now and a lot in that definition. But water baptism doesn't save us. I know that there are scriptures that imply washing away of sins and things, but that's the symbolic part. We're always saved by grace through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what saves us. And even though water baptism isn't necessary for salvation, otherwise the thief on the cross couldn't go to paradise, baptism is a necessary part of our Christian obedience 
growth, and witness. So we're going to take a look at six different points to talk about the importance of baptism today. First, uh, as we explore it, we're going to see it's a central part of our mission in Matthew 28. It is not optional, but a commandment. And we're going to take a look at Jesus' own baptism in Matthew 3. And we're going to see the connection between baptism, which is Jesus' death and resurrection, and picking up our crosses as we identify with Jesus and follow him. And three more points. Baptism is a public witness of our faith in Jesus. Fifth, we are immersed in Christ, especially in his forgiveness and in his power. The Greek word baptizo means to wash, it means to dip, but its main meaning is to immerse, to be totally absorbed. Through it, we are unified as members of the same body. So let's start with point number one. Baptism is a central aspect of our mission. The words of Jesus in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So to make disciples, we have three verbs in this passage. We are to go, that's evangelism. We are to teach, that's Bible study, that's instruction. This church is very, very good at that, at offering you options and times and different subjects to be able to dig into God's word and to discover who you are. Here at Highlands, our mission statement is a great commitment to the great commandment and this great commission in Matthew 28. So we are also to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice it doesn't say the names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, in the name of the triune God. Often in the New Testament, you'll see the people were baptized in the name of Jesus. It's saying the same thing. Uh, When you are baptized into someone's name, it means that you are under their authority. So in this passage, in addition to being under the authority of Jesus, we are also delegated the authority of Jesus to offer our neighbors the same forgiveness of sins that we have, the same eternal salvation that we have and the same entrance into a new community that we have. Secondly, baptism is not optional, but a commandment. And here we feel a specific mode of baptism. Why should we be baptized by immersion? Okay. First of all, Jesus commanded it. We just saw that in Matthew 28. Secondly, Jesus modeled it. We're going to take a look at that in a minute. And thirdly, it's our public witness to the world. And it's how we join the community of faith. So, let's take a look at Jesus' own baptism in Matthew 3. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Remember that phrase. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. In Jesus' day, baptisms were used by different Jewish groups for initiation purposes or for ritual cleansing. John the Baptist baptized Jews who were preparing for the imminent coming of the Messiah. And it was a baptism of repentance, 
meaning I want to turn away from my sins, be cleansed from them, and walk a new clean path with the Messiah. And after Jesus' resurrection, and even after his command to baptize, repentance is still required. Now, this phrase, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, is a reference to the day of Pentecost. Okay, you remember that? 120 believers in a 10-day prayer meeting after Jesus ascended, he said, go, wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. They didn't know what to expect, but they're praying together. And as they were praying, the Holy Spirit came down in tongues of fire, and those tongues of fire became tongues on fire. To be able to speak to assorted uh, visitors to Jerusalem who were there for the festival in different languages, languages that they had never studied. And it was a great miracle, and the people hearing the gospel heard it and repented. Jesus still baptizes us with the Holy Spirit today. Although I have to admit, I've never seen a tongue of fire on any of your heads. Uh, I did see a uh, battery in a computer uh, explode, and we had holy smoke uh, up here one uh, Sunday night. But uh, God is a God of variety. He doesn't always baptize the same way. But we still get baptized for the power to witness. Believe that. Okay? And he doesn't always do it in a particular order. He's unique. And he, he likes variety. So Jesus submitted to baptism, even though John was at first reluctant. And the phrase Jesus used to convince John was to fulfill all righteousness. Meaning that it was the right thing to do in the Father's eyes. John was the one baptizing for repentance to prepare for the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. But the Father saw fit to have Jesus submit to baptism himself, even though he didn't need to repent. But I think he did it for our benefit, as the model. Jesus submitted to baptism just as much as he submitted to being raised by Joseph and Mary. Remember, when he was age 12, he was ready to go. He was ready to start preaching. But Joseph and Mary wanted him to come back home, and he submitted to their parental authority. And God had a plan for that. The father had a plan that, that Joseph would be taken to be with him, and Jesus would be the head of that family. And for some years, Jesus experienced being a father to his younger siblings. And then at age 30 the age when a priest is anointed and ordained, that's when he began his public ministry. So God had a plan for Jesus, a model that we are to learn from. What we are to learn from in this baptism is that we too need to submit to baptism. It's a part of God's will for us, and it's appropriate to follow that example. And in addition to that, this was done in public. So in that public confirmation, John is affirmed at, through prophecy as the voice crying in the wilderness, and Jesus is affirmed as the Messiah himself. And it's not only John's disciples that got to see this and witness it, but also John's enemies, the scribes, the priests, and the Pharisees were there. People that John described as a bunch of snakes. But the witness, folks, our public witness uh, in, in baptism uh, we, we don't get to pick the crowd. The crowd is there. And the crowd is there for a reason. Remember, Paul, before he became Paul, killed Christians. He was one of the snakes. He was a Pharisee. But he was brought to his knees by a revelation of Jesus himself. And he became the great apostle Paul. So... It doesn't matter who you witness to. It matters what they do with it. So, but we need power to be able to do that. And it's appropriate to follow Jesus' example. Let me give you one more illustration of the command to baptize with water. This is in Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 47. 
Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized. The he in this verse is Peter. Peter had been prepared for a couple of chapters by visions and dreams and even visitors coming to him to visit the home of a Gentile. Now, normally, Peter, as a devout Jew, would never do that. But the Holy Spirit opened the way and said, yes, I'm in this. Follow through. So Peter entered the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. His family is there. We don't know how many other people, but it was kind of a gathering. And Peter preached to them. Uh, Jesus as the Messiah. And these Gentiles received the word, believed, and then they immediately began to speak in tongues and manifesting uh, other aspects of the Holy Spirit to where Peter says, whoa, these people have demonstrated the same Holy Spirit manifestations that we have as Jews. So what's to prevent them from being baptized with water? The two are interconnected. But in this case, the Holy Spirit part came before the water part. But the two are connected. Water baptism is always the first and most appropriate response to believing in Christ. I already mentioned that that the order was different. But I I want to also mention that every time the gospel goes into a new area, uh, the the outline of the book of Acts is Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the earth, or the Gentile world. Uh, Every time the gospel goes into a new area, even in our lifetime, you see some of these manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but they don't last forever. They're there as signs and wonders at the beginning to show a new people group the the power of God and and to display his love for them. Uh, But then when uh, things settle down and and the churches become formed and, and, you know, just as we are, you know, after several hundred years of uh, churches in America, you can get lazy. You can kind of rest on somebody else's faith. But God always has ways to kind of shake us up. But he is still baptizing us, folks. We are commanded in the scripture to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Don't leak. Unless you're going to leak on them. Then be a fountain. So, let's go to point number three. This is something we've already referred to. Identifying with Jesus' death and resurrection. In Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, no longer enslaved to sin. Notice that we are baptized into Christ Jesus, and as such we are baptized into his death, buried with him, and then raised with him, that we too might walk into a new life. Now let me pause there. Literally, we're talking about Jesus died. The God of the universe laid down his life for us. He died. But he's risen from the dead. And our salvation is pictured the same way. We were just as dead. Just as dead. But because of his Action because of our faith in him and what he's done. We are not just raised symbolically, but we are actually raised from the deadness of that spiritual death into a new life, brand new. And one of the aspects of that, yes, glory to God. One of the aspects of that is that we are no longer slaves to sin. In case you haven't heard it lately, that is the normal condition of every human being born, slave to sin. Without a direct intervention of God or putting our trust in Jesus, the destination of every human being is not tongues of fire, it's tons of fire. That's the direction. Only faith in Christ can change that direction and that destination. But we 
get that. When we are baptized into him, we have no longer a slavery to sin. Now, that also means without excuse. Right? So that if we are struggling with sin, we need to find where his strength is, where his grace is, where his power is. We must. It's God's grace and it's the Holy Spirit's power that saves us. It's not my own. I have to admit my weakness and reach for his strength. Paul amplifies this in Galatians chapter 2 when we're told to die daily to self and sin because that old nature wants to come back big time. Right? Just like those cinnamon buns at the roadhouse. We do have a group for that. <laughs> Jesus put it this way, pick up your crosses, die to yourself, follow me. It's all, it's all one sentence, folks. The cross is where we're supposed to die. That old nature is supposed to die. So the new one can burst forth. So baptism is our first step, our entrance, our initiation into that narrow road Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. And the end of that road are the gates of heaven with wonders beyond our imagination. Wow. Let's go to point four, showing our public commitment to Jesus. For this, we go back to Acts chapter two. The words of Peter at the end of his sermon Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Peter had preached a great sermon. We don't even have the entirety of it. right? uh, Luke decided to kind of condense uh, a a lot of it, but he said, Peter exhorted them with all kinds of of admonitions, save yourself from this wicked world, this crooked generation. And they they were touched with that sermon. And they said, what do we do? His answer, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And there were 3,000 people who responded. Who would have thought 120 people praying that morning would leave that upper room start preaching in languages they never learned, and see a harvest of 3,000 souls. And they were all baptized in that day. My mind boggles. What a day that must have been. But, you know, I'm, I'm a guy of organization, okay? And I go, okay, 120 disciples, 3,000 converts. Do the math. That's one disciple for every 25 converts. So if I were Peter, I'd say, okay, each one of you cut out 25. Those are yours. Go march to the Jordan River, get them baptized, and let's get some Bible studies going, let people open up their homes. <laughs> right? And that's probably very close to what did happen on that day. There was excitement. There was momentum. There was the Holy Spirit. That was a whole part of that. Now, The act of baptism, in this case, says, I believe, I receive, I also am called to witness and to make disciples. So let's look at point number five, being immersed in Christ. For this we go to Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Again, this passage talks about identifying with Jesus' death and resurrection. It is the number one symbolic image in the New Testament. And our old self is described as dead in our trespasses. But our new self is alive through God's forgiveness. We are now dead to the power of sin and Satan and alive with a clean slate 
because our sin debt had a legal demand from God himself. The wages of sin is death, the death penalty. But if you belong to Jesus, the other half of that verse says eternal life is waiting for us. So this gives us a word picture for how Jesus paid our debt on the cross. When he mouthed the words, it is finished, Jesus was declaring that that debt was paid by him. And some of you may already be aware of this, but in Jesus' day, uh, there was a a banking system where you could get money loaned to you, just like today. Uh, But there was a paper, and the paper was usually posted in a public area. It would say, Pastor Dave owes so so many shekels to, uh, to somebody. And when that debt was finally paid, the banker had a stamp that said, it is finished. And then you could destroy the document. But it was always a public record. Much more public than today in terms of being out there for everybody to see. Although the internet gives us a lot of access into seeing into people's lives. But nevertheless, that document, it says in Colossians 2, a document similar to that was nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross that says it is finished. You do know that it wasn't the nails that held Jesus on the cross. It was his love for you and me that kept him on the cross. He could have left at any time. He stayed there to pay the debt. And he paid for it with his life, every drop of blood. Not only that, At the same time, he disarmed our spiritual enemies. Disarmed them. They can't touch us unless we believe their lies. And he humiliated them. His triumph is also our victory because we get his power granted to us in our spiritual battles. So we are indeed immersed in Christ, all in saturated with him, filled with his grace and his truth. You know, we really all should be carrying a banner over our heads that says, under new management, right? I failed. (laughs) Jesus doesn't. Let's look at our final point, number six. Baptism unifies us as members of one body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, It says, in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jew or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. This baptism of water and the baptism in the spirit unites us in spite of our diversity, in spite of our differences. We have common ground. As Paul put it to the Ephesians, we share one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And he expands on our diversity in Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 27. He says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now, just prior to this passage, in verse 26, believers are called sons of God. But the Greek word there is not a a uh, male-specific word. It's the word H-U-I-O-I, huyoi, which is a legal term meaning heir. It applies equally to males and females. So we are heirs together uh, uh, as Abraham's offspring. When we are baptized into Christ... We put on Christ like clothing. Colossians 3 gives us a partial list of what to put off. Sexual immorality, impurity, evil desire, greed, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. And what to put on. Compassion, kindness, humility, 
meekness, patience, forgiveness, love. Now, it makes sense that we would get new garments. We're clean. We're cleansed. So why not get a new suit? And that new suit is in the image of Christ. And it gives us a new identity and a new purpose. We are sons of God, whether we are Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You could even add to that in modern day, whether you are 49er or Raider. Dare I say whether you are Democrat or Republican? Because any label we put above Son of God and heir according to the promise is out of order. Our highest calling, our highest identity is Son of God. And we should be able in this sanctuary to worship together, no matter what our other labels are. That's what they did in the first century. Jew and Gentile, that was a big divide, a big cultural gap. They learned how to worship together, how to reconcile those differences. Slave and free, can you imagine slaves and masters worshiping together, considering each other equals? And male and female, no more false inferiority or superiority going on there. No macho. Now, Paul is not encouraging gender confusion or making same-sex relationships acceptable. The word of God is teaching us that in this new body called the church, any division needs to be reconciled. Any wrongful attitude of superiority or inferiority is abolished. We could add rich or poor. Our unity in the church often celebrates our diversity and our uniqueness. Look around. We get a little taste of heaven every Sunday morning. There are people here from various tribes and tongues, different nations. Some of you were born in other countries. God bless you. Welcome. Some of us want to move to other countries. But baptism is not a cookie cutter. It doesn't make us all the same... It does include royal robes. Think prodigal son. And we are all joint heirs together of what's awaiting us in heaven. So there's an abundance of scriptural support for water baptism. And some of you may, may still have questions. But any pastor here can answer those questions, whether it's about theology or some of the practical aspects of baptism. You know, sometimes it's just plain fear. Uh, of being in front of people. But don't hold back. The water baptism is a part of, of the unity of the church. And don't you feel the applause every time somebody comes up out of that water, every time we hear their testimony? There's applause in this place. There's applause. That echoes heaven. Right? There's applause when anybody comes to Christ. So even if you, like me, had negative experiences with water. We can work it out. By the way, does God have a sense of humor? I was baptized 50 years ago in a swimming pool. God can redeem anything. And we want his hand everywhere, don't we? We want his touch. We want to be immersed in him. Now, there's only one good reason not to be baptized, and that is you're not sure of your relationship with the Lord. So I'm going to end this message by solving that dilemma. If there are any here who want to join with us in calling Jesus Lord and Savior, just pray with me silently as we end this message. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins. You paid the debt. And I am more than grateful. I want to follow you. I want to declare you as my Lord and my Savior. So take my life, Lord. I'm all in. I surrender all. Just 
Make something good out of me, Lord. Shape me into the image of Christ himself. And all God's people say, amen. Amen.